Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're chatting about homelessness in America, and we're benefiting from the practical experience of leaders of great nonprofits in Detroit, Charlotte, New York. So we'll be, we'll be talking with special guests, Dr. Chad Audie, President and CEO of the Detroit Rescue Mission uh, Ministries, uh, Pedro Perez, uh, Executive Director of Charlotte Family Housing, and James Winans, President and CEO of the Bowery Mission in New York. So thank you all for joining us. It's it's so it's so great. I'm going to uh, go to you, Chad. Uh, but but before I do, I just want to set this up. Uh, there are some statistics that we all should know. Half a million uh, people in America experience homelessness. Half a million. Half a million in this country. Thirty percent are families with children. Seventy percent are individuals living on their own or in community with other adults. So depending on how you you count employment. We have 7 million workers living below the poverty line in this country, and there are a huge group of people who are housing insecure. So in addition to that half million, many people are housing insecure, and they transition from being housed to being homeless and then back again in in regular cycles. So 90 years ago, during the Great Depression, we saw huge encampments of homeless uh, folks scattered around the country. We've all seen the black and white um, uh, uh, footage of that. So, uh, Chad, let's start with your perspective from Detroit at the Detroit Rescue Mission. What is the situation in your area and, and how do you go about addressing it? Thank you for having me, first of all. And uh, I, think, I think the numbers that uh, New York Times has put, I think they're very conservative numbers. Right. Uh, same here in Detroit, the situation is higher than it's been reported uh, and I think there is a lot of movement out there that they're changing the definition of homelessness to reduce the number that we can show. Uh, but the fact remains that there is more homeless and more people who are in need. So to, to give you a little bit of things, what's going on here in Detroit, the, we have in any given day more than 3,000 people who are homeless, chronicle homeless. The number of homeless in general exceed the number 13,000 in the, in the metro uh, area. The, we have been with other people trying to do what we can to accommodate the homeless population in a much better place so they can, we don't just fix, patch the problem. We really wanna fix the problem if we can. And to be able to fix the problem, we have to go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem for homelessness, in my mind, and a lot of research has been done, is basically based on major three areas, which is economical situation cause homelessness, the second one, mental health, and drug and substance abuse. Those are the main areas. And if you don't start solving the issues with the, with the substance abuse uh, drugs, the mental health issues, economic issues, it's easy to fix. It's the easiest one among all. The problem is with the people who have mental health issues and the people who are dependent on alcohol and drugs. And uh, here in Detroit, the numbers has been escalating instead of going side, uh, is, is going down. And for the Chad, we're going to come back to that. Sure. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to continue around the table, but we're going to come back to that. Um, the, the the thing that I think is is really important um, uh, in this in this first segment is you pointed out three thousand chronic. That yes. means really rotating it through the homeless homelessness system uh, five times that much. Um, uh, being um, periodically uh, homeless, and your point that it's it's likely a vast undercount of of, of the issue. So, uh, Pedro, how do you see it from your perspective in in Charlotte? How, uh, taking Chad's cue and talking about Charlotte, how how do you see the situation? Well, I agree with him with respect to the to the three categories that he mentioned, and we have to understand the historical. Uh, reasons for that. So, for instance, with respect to mental health, uh, Geraldo Rivera did an expose years ago regarding Willard Mental Health Institution, and then the nation was outraged because of the way the folks that were suffering from mental health were being treated. 
And so the, the nation decided, we decided as a nation that we wanted to get rid of state-run mental health institutions with an alleged promise that we were going to do community-based mental health care. Well, what we actually did was never fund that. And so we ended up having our prisons become our mental health institutions. And part of the criminalization of poverty and homelessness has been the result that we see now. And so the invisible homeless that we deal with here in Charlotte, uh, my agency, Charlotte Family Housing, we're an agency that empowers working families experiencing homelessness to achieve so lifelong self-sufficiency through, 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 through shelter, housing, supportive services, and advocacy. We find that many of the folks that are homeless don't tell anyone they're homeless. Many of the working families that are working every single day find themselves homeless. One of the reasons for that is that first of all, the affordable housing crisis that exists throughout the country impacts that. And probably just as importantly, if not more importantly, we still do not provide a living wage to our community and to our people. And Ken Kutchman just, just pointed out- the United States. I, I just wanted to, to add to that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish. Ken Kutchman just, just uh, pointed out that, you know, as as people as people come into the uh, inner city and uh, transition, the SRO um, single room occupancy hotels and other facilities that used to alleviate some of that pressure into uh, into apartment buildings that can be sold, right? You you kind of dry up that housing um, that that in place housing um, uh, facility. And what happens? People move out onto the streets and then you have encampments. Uh, right, Pedro? Yes, absolutely. And, and let me just point one, one, one critical factor that I think often we are overlooking. As a result of the pandemic, a very necessary policy was established, the eviction moratorium. The unintended consequence of that eviction moratorium has been that those property owners that could raise rents to support themselves because they're entitled to make a living as well, raise the rents to the point at which now, for instance, here, a three bedroom apartment for a family of four is $1,500 an hour. I mean, $1,500 uh, a month. Uh, when you look at what they can earn, many of these folks are cash cost burden, as you've pointed out. And especially when you have a minimum wage of $7.25, even moving that wage to $15 an hour, which has been a large discussion that has gone on throughout the country, here in, in Charlotte, the area median income is $82,000. $15 an hour only gets you to $35,000, just a little under half of what you would need to be able to afford to live comfortably, not extravagantly, just comfortably here in Charlotte. So those are some of the intersectional issues that we need to look at. And James, um, New York is the most affordable city in the country, right? Uh, it's it's it, uh, those those issues don't apply to you, right? Uh, we've been we've been sharing our unaffordability with the whole nation in the last year. Um, but you're right. I mean, 13 percent of our nation's homeless population lives right here in New York City, which you know outstrips any other city in the nation. We have 80,000 New Yorkers experiencing homelessness right now. Um, you know, one thing that New York City perhaps does better than other cities uh, as a gov city government is get folks indoors. Um, but getting folks indoors is not is not the whole story. And um, I think we saw very clearly last year um, as as New York City in many ways got uh, hit first in the COVID pandemic and went into shutdown early. Uh, we were being told to stay at home. All right. New Yorkers should stay at home. That's how we're going to defeat this virus. Um, and yet there are thousands and thousands of New Yorkers who do not have a place to call home. And so I think it really highlighted for, uh, for me, one, how quickly we can um, uh, let, let other policy priorities overrun uh, the, the priority of homelessness. But it also highlighted the distinct experience that people without a home are having in our country. Um, uh, you know, when New York City shut down, uh, lots of informal employment ended. Um, and we saw the number of people on our on our meal line double as people were suddenly not making ends meet and wondering where they could get the food to feed their family. Um, the places, the informal places to use the bathroom and wash, uh, shut down. Right. So when the libraries are, are all closed and the you know the, the the recreation centers are all closed and all the the office lobbies are closed and the Starbucks is closed. 
and you don't have a home, where do you go to wash? And so the Bowery Mission uh, quickly partnered with another organization to get uh, showers out on our sidewalk in a, in, a, in a mobile shower van where people could get a private shower and then some clothes. Uh, we put toilets out on the sidewalk to make sure that people could, could use the restroom. These basic needs uh, that we were struggling to meet in the United States in 2020. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think the other, the other thing to keep in mind here is that, that um, and, and, and uh, Chad and Pedro uh, highlighted this in a way, um, when we talk about homelessness, people, people ask me, what's the solution, right? And, and, and sometimes my answer is, what is the solution to sickness? And we, we, we actually have to go a lot deeper to answer the question. Yeah. And you're all nodding. I mean, this this point that it's a very textured series of, uh, of interconnected issues, mm -hmm. um, I think, is is really important. But I'd like to come back to Chad because I did uh, rudely cut you off, Chad, as I was going to to Pedro. You were making a, a point. You made a point about three different issues. The the issues being economic issues, so jobs and income. The second point being mental health but separate as a separate category from, uh, from addiction and drug use. And then the third is being uh, addiction and drug use. Now, it seems to me that in each of these categories, there are actually actions that, that can be taken. Um, so can, can we get back to some of the points that I so rudely uh, stopped you from making before and, and, uh, and start to honor them? And then we'll also go around the, this, this uh, virtual table and everybody uh, can talk a little bit about, about what they're doing in their area. Not at all. I, it wasn't rude. Thank you for <laughs> allowing me. But, uh, but yes, if we don't uh, treat the root of the problems, we're going to keep going on circles. So um, unfortunate part that there is not enough funding that has been given to the problems. The people go and they say the solution of homelessness is by providing low-income housing, or just build apartments or a single room occupancy or whatever. That is fine, but that does not fix the problem. The people need a lot of support. They need a lot of, uh, you need to build on their ability to survive on their own. Otherwise they're gonna be, continue to be dependent on the system somehow. So therefore uh, the real starts by what the government is doing right now by changing the definition of homeless. Let me give you a few things here that are very important because that affect the numbers. The government right now under HUD rules, for example, if somebody is in treatment, who is an inpatient treatment, and he leaves the inpatient treatment and he doesn't have any source of income, he's not allowed to go to a shelter or a transitional housing because he's not qualified under homeless. That people don't know that. If a veteran, for example, refused to take for any reason assistance that's been given to him as a voucher for him to go or for her to go get a housing of some sort and they deny it for any source, they're no longer homeless. So the questions become, if somebody coming out of jail or somebody coming out of prison because they say they had an address, they're no longer eligible for assistance under homelessness. So the question is, are those people homeless or they're not homeless? I think well, they're- Well, you, yeah. know, you know because of where they're sleeping tonight, right? That's correct. That That's is how correct. you know. That's so, 100%. So um, uh, Pedro, James, could you comment on, on what Chad is talking about? Are you finding that the, the rigidity of the of the issue uh, of the, of the system, and that's what you're talking about, Chad? Right? You're talking yes. about the rigidity of the system. Right. That, that that is actually a, a contributing factor in your areas uh, to, to to this issue, uh, Pedro. You want to weigh in, James? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are two 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 points I'd want to make on that. One, the, the there is this this unfortunate phenomenon called source of income discrimination. And what that means is that there are property owners who will refuse to accept a HUD voucher, will refuse to accept anyone that has a subsidy because they have this stereotypical idea of someone who is accepting these or has these vouchers are somehow going to drop the value of their property. So we need to eliminate and change the source of income discrimination that exists throughout many cities. Second, uh, you have the benefits cliff in which 
poor folks who are trying to lift themselves out of poverty, as soon as they make one cent over the threshold for food stamps or TANF, are then have their benefits reduced. And so we create dependency as opposed to interdependency or the fact to be able to survive on our, on our own efforts. So those are the things that are impacting us. So that's the rigidity of how HUD defines homelessness. You know, you can, so, and, and there are many people who are couch surfing who are not counted every January in the point of, in the, in the point of count uh, that occurs at that time. So any of these numbers are completely inaccurate because not everyone is counted. This is an estimate. So, so in terms of the rigidity here, let's, let's keep going. And, and James will try to rejoin. Uh, he's having some technical difficulties. But, you know, you can't have a system that you can administer without some standards, without some systems in place. And no matter where you create that systemic approach, that workflow, that standard, I mean, that's that's sort of the criticism of, of, of anything, right? So what, what's, what's the solution, Chad? I mean, we can't just have infinite flexibility of these things. So how do we, how do, we do practical management? You right? know, as far, as far as we're concerned, we, we, we are sick of the government rules and the regulation, and then we focus on helping the people who comes to, through our doors, whether if the government is going to pay for it or they're not going to pay for it. The bottom line to us is you can't turn anyone away and you need to cater to people's needs and you got to meet them where they're at. And then that's why we depend on the generosity of the people outside the government regulation. Uh, are the government putting a lot of pressure on us? Definitely. Are they uh, putting a lot of regulation on us? Definitely. But the bottom line is we as organizations who are dealing with the problem day in and day out, we are in, in direct contact with the people who are in need. We had to come and become creative and find ways to be able to meet the needs of the people. And uh, that's created a big burden on the organization like us and like Petros and like everybody else who deals with those situations. Uh, but we're doing we're doing good as far as we're concerned. We are doing good because we understand the population that we are dealing with. It. So you will see today that the organization, most nonprofit organization, are not focusing any more on one thing anymore. They have to branch out to create more arms and more work to make sure that the population that they're dealing with become more effective and more independent. For example, uh, we, when the rescue mission started, it was only to feed people and shelter people overnight. This is not enough anymore. We need to go and do the treatment. We need to go and find permanent housing. We need to build homes. We need to build single room occupancy. This is not even talking about the new pandemic that happened that forced us right now to start talking about decongregation of the population because you no longer can put them next to each other. You have to uh, make sure that people are safe uh, when you're providing with services. So, so, so the key is there is so solution, we, but it's, it's a high cost. We have to start treating people within cities as if they belong in cities as opposed to uh, trying to push them out. I think that's, that's your, your basic point. Uh, Pedro, in, in terms of, of the programs, let's let's just sort of go through the kinds of programs that you provide, uh, because they're going to be fairly similar to what's done in in uh, Detroit or in New York or any place or, um, around the country that is a major metro. So we'll talk about uh, rural areas in a bit. But could you just sort of talk about the kind of services that you provide uh, in Charlotte? Sure, absolutely. But let, let me go to your point of rigidity in terms of in terms of the issue of, you know, you, you mentioned that there, we have to at some point uh, realize that we can't always be as fully flexible in any policy we establish. Well, I want to push back on that a little bit. I think we can create a ramp for these benefits that are provided to families. And as their income increases, we slowly decrease the benefits that they have so that they can make adjustments and learn how to navigate the economic difficulties that they've been through. Now, with respect to the services that Charlotte Family Housing provides, we're a three-phase program. The first phase is our pre-housing phase, or what's commonly called shelter phase. And we have we have we had 21 rooms that we were able to provide, and we didn't have a, a mass open uh, uh, room congregational setting in which people were sit, sleeping in cots 
nearby each other. Each family had an individual room for themselves. That's how we established our program. And so in that pre-housing in that pre-housing phase, we provide clinically licensed social workers who are trauma-informed with respect to how they do their care and their counseling. We provide financial literacy programs and many, many other workshops in that phase. Once that, and we require and ask our families because we serve primarily, in fact, exclusively working families that are experiencing homelessness, because that's one of the invisible homeless populations that are not served by governmental uh, auspices or, or by normal traditional homeless agencies uh, because of the nature of, their, of what they're doing. Once we have them save enough for, the fir- for, a, for 30% of the, of the rent, we subsidize 70% of their rent and keep them in subsidized housing for up to two years until they're ready to move out to unsubsidized housing. And then we continue to track them for the next two years. One, one point, we in 2019 began surveying, we, we had been surveying families, we began asking this question, have you been able to acquire a mortgage and have you been approved for that mortgage? We surveyed 411 of our graduates, 57 are now living in their own home that they have gotten mortgages for themselves. This is a solvable problem. We just need the political will as a nation to use the resources we have to solve the problem. I I think that that it is possible for us to do that. And we partner and collaborate with all of the other agencies that are part of the homelessness ecosystem because we recognize that as we move families out of homelessness, that's helping those agencies open up beds for other folks. And they refer families to us that they normally cannot serve because of of their regulations. They may be working families that they cannot serve. And James, um, uh, thank you so much for for, uh, resolving some of your your technical issues. We really appreciate it. Chad had uh, had talked about the rigidity of the system, and um, and then you heard uh, a part of uh, Pedro's answer where where he described some of his uh, programs, and was pushing back on a point that I had made that that you know any system is going to have standards. Uh, Pedro basically pushed back and said yes, but you can create a ramp uh, there. Um, I also wanted to just uh, mention before we start uh, talking about what's going on uh, in New York. Um, we just talked. We just did a, a survey on, the, on what what people think the three top causes of homelessness are, and we have um, uh, three different areas which which received fairly uh, consistent results. Uh, one is um, historic and, and systemic um, uh, inequities based in race, ethnicity, uh, marginalized communities. There's mental health and addiction and wages. So you've got those those uh, different factors with a, a big dollop of inequality and attitude of this society that needs to change. Uh, James, uh, talk a little bit about how you see um, providing services uh, in a New York context and what could be done to help you be, as, as uh, Pedro said, he's talking a little bit more of a ramp and a transition out and try to help in a sustained way those families that can transition out. How do you see uh, your objectives going forward? Well, I think, um, it, it, you know, in New, in New York City, there's an extraordinary government bureaucracy around um, providing care for folks who are homeless. And I mentioned earlier that, that the one thing it's very good at is, is getting people indoors overnight. So bureaucracy um, good or bureaucracy bad? Well, bureaucracy is... Um, uh, is very limited at caring for the individual. And so, you know, as I, as I described earlier, um, uh, the, the, you know, what's the solution to homelessness? Well, what's the solution to sickness, right? So, so, so what, what are the symptoms? How long have you been sick? How is it impacting your life, right? Kind of all of, just take out the word sickness and, and, and insert homelessness. And you'll discover that every person that we serve has a has a has a story that is diverse and different from the from the next story. And bureaucracies um, are are terrible at individual stuff. So that's that's where you know bureaucracy might have some useful function, but it has to be limited because they're terrible at a big part of this problem, right? I, I, I'd say that's true. And then the antidote to that then is community. So how do we create communities of recovery from homelessness? How do we create places where um, 
uh, folks together can 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 engage in mutual support and support from the community, um, and and ha- experience something that's holistic and transformative, um, where you know we're, we're we're by mutually supporting one another, we're we're lifting one another out of out of homelessness, and so that's really um, been the focus of the Bowery Mission: is how do we create these these uh, residences of care where. Um, where we're, we're addressing the whole person, where, where we're actually partnering with that person in their solution, right? That we we don't we don't do for people, we do with people. Um, and each person who's in our in our residential programs has kind of kind of helped co co-author an individualized action plan, something that says this is where I am, I acknowledge where I am, and this is where I'm headed. Uh, and it's holistic, right? It addresses it addresses the person holistically as an emotional person, a spiritual person, um, you know, somebody who, who, who does have uh, places of community and family and connection, who does have goals and dreams for their future, you know, vocationally and employment wise, um, and, and certainly also um, is, ho- is hoping to be in, in housing. Um, and so, um, so, so bureaucracies are really hard. It's really hard to, to, to have bureaucracies do that. And I think a question alongside some of the policy questions that we have very rightfully discussed in this call um, is, you know, how do we engage uh, communities of care? How do we, how do we get past our own, uh, our own individual focus so that we can focus on, on, on the neighbor next to us? And um, do you buy this, this idea that James, uh, there are two ideas that I thought were very intriguing that James put forth. One is the analogy to, uh, to physical health, sickness, right? Of homelessness, if you if you just think of it in that way, you then can develop a more sophisticated approach. And the other piece is this idea that government might be good at some things, but terrible at others. So the the, the combination of community, which um, you know nonprofits are much better at uh, perhaps than than government uh, actors. How do you respond to those two from your perspective? And you have a very uh, broad set of set of experiences. How do you view this? I I, I definitely agree with James, but uh, I think on the government level, yes, definitely the government is good at certain things and bad in others. The difference between the government and the nonprofit organizations is the in the nonprofit you can you, you're more flexible to to meet the needs of the people without going through the bureaucracy that the government has in place. And you can close uh, a program that doesn't work, right? You can read that, the that's true. It's, it's, at it's, any, Yeah, at any given time, you can immediately diagnose your programs and find out if they're effective, they're not effective. And uh, and with, with a very high speed, you can change and bring more resources if you want to versus the government. You would have to sometimes wait two years for you go, to go through the whole process in order to make one little change. So yes, uh, the nonprofit organization is the solution, it's not the government. But we need the support of the government to continue to provide the services that we can. And this is where the problem starts because the government if value things and do things totally different than what we see as people who are on the front line with contact with the needs of the people on a daily basis. The government by them to change it, it might take them you know, the Congress has to go. I mean, it's a whole process to do something. So if they give us the flexibility and then give us the support needed, then we can make a lot of changes as soon as possible because we are the community. And one important thing I want to say that, yes, it is true that we have to look at uh, homeless as part of our community and not people who are on the sideline and they're not human. They are good people. They have a lot of skills. They have a lot of potentials and we can build on their potential. We can engage them back into the community in the right way. It's not right to move them out of our community. They, they are part of our community and they are good people. And that's what the problem is. Most people don't know what homeless mean. A lot of people, they picture the homeless of that guy who is a panhandler sitting on the right of the corner. That's 99% of those panhandlers. They're not homeless. The homeless is a whole different people who are like me, who could be homeless in two weeks. Anybody who's way far, I mean, probably far as as two paychecks from being homeless. 
those are people who are very good, very nice, have a lot of potential. They read the news. They know what's going on in the community. They are part of the community. And we need to treat them as such. That's what I think. And this is how we solve those problems. Pedro, we're going to give uh, Charlotte the last word uh, because we're coming to the end of our time. I just wanted to point out that we did uh, ask a, a, a question on how to reduce um, homelessness. And um, it, it was interesting. Um, the, the top answer, uh, we conflated uh, behavioral health and substance use disorder issues, was, was dealing with, with, with those dual problems in, in the, uh, the three-legged um, stool that, that uh, Chad pos uh, uh, posited, um, uh, economics, uh, addiction, and behavioral uh, health issues. So that was very interesting. Um, and there's also uh, quite a bit of support for temporary and transitional housing to help those people in, in chronic need. Um, uh, Pedro, if you were going to sum up what we all should be doing, what we should all be thinking, what I should be doing tomorrow, right, how I should be behaving, what I should support to make this situation better, I don't think that there is a light switch solution. This is too complex a problem, as James said. Right. You have to look at it from from a much higher game as if as if we have a sickness and we're trying to treat it as a society. What should I be be changing in myself? In order to be part of the solution here, understanding who is homeless for one, demystifying and de-stereotyping the homeless population into a single man standing on the street suffering from mental illness or addiction. Many people are homeless that don't fit that description. So we need to first change that narrative. Uh, for instance, a woman escaping with a master's degree, domestic violence becomes homeless. Highly educated, highly successful, but yet she is homeless. She's not homeless because of anything she did wrong, except for maybe marrying an abusive husband. And how would she know that until she married him? So that's the other thing. And so the other thing that I would say is that there are there are we need to have universal health care and universal child care and a living wage passed by this nation. If we were to do those three things, if you if if all of us were to advocate intensely for those three things, we would solve a number of different problems that we're facing in this nation. And then finally, the notion of what is affordable housing? Uh, housing is affordable to somebody. But if we don't have affordable housing, how are we going to get folks that could have moved into a home actually have their own home, have their own apartment and live in a sustainable way long term? You know, you're making so many good points, there's, but, but there's one that does that does stand out. This whole idea of if we invest in, in these kinds of things, do we actually reduce the social impact and the economic impact of homelessness? Uh, across uh, and housing insecurity across a, a really broad swath. I'm, I'm very interested in taking a look at the interaction of, of the social impact and the return on investment of different um, ways of spending um, our rare tax dollars. I'm going to try and uh, put together a show on this. So afterwards, let's, let's us all talk. I'll, I'll give you a call, but let's all talk about um, how we can actually illuminate some of some of uh, this. Dr. Chad uh, Audi, President and CEO of the Detroit Rescue Mission Ministries, Pedro Perez, um, Executive Director of Charlotte Family Housing, and James Winans, President and CEO of the Bowery Mission in New York. This has been such an illuminating discussion. You've made so many sophisticated points, and I'm so grateful. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your boards, thank your donors, and thank your community, and thank people who are homeless, who are trying to work with you to resolve this uh, for themselves and, and for communities, and perhaps also for their homeless neighbors to help them as well uh, transition into a house state. Uh, thank you so much, and, and stay healthy. Have a good Thanksgiving. You as well. Thank, thank you, Mark. You.